Great. Well, thank you everybody for coming back on short notice. Uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Brian Reedy from Vanderbilt University, as well as Dr. Tony Schwery from Dana-Farber. We're going to talk about clinical and scientific updates in kidney cancer. I'll hand it over to you all. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I turned it on this time, so I get my reflexes back. That's good. So we thought, like last year, to have a session dedicated uh, all the way from clinical trial translational work as well as, well as uh, trials in progress, the trials that are happening. And we're going to kick off this session by um, summarizing the recent clinical trials result with Dr. Betsy Plimak here. Uh, Dr. Plimak is professor of uh, Meds Temple and uh, the, the director of the GU Oncology program at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Dr. Plimak. Hey, okay, yes. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much for inviting me. So um, hopefully my slide will render here and I have seven minutes on the timer. Is that right? Okay. All right, let's get started. So I was asked to talk about clinical trial results in 2021. And although all our meetings were virtual, there were a lot of great results presented. And so I picked the top five to talk about today. David, can we advance? Sorry, okay. Um, so these, you know, might not be everybody's top five, but they're sort of the top five that I thought would be most relevant for this audience to talk about. And I'll go through the, um, the data and some of the results. So we'll start with the Cantata trial. So this, okay, so this is a randomized phase three trial. Here's the design. Oh, here's the drug. Okay, so teleglenostat is a novel agent, and we're always really excited, I think, when we see new agents in kidney cancer, um, and we're eager to test them out. So there was some early data that teleglenostat with cabozantinib was very active. This was in about 10 or 12 patients. Um, but this drug in, uh, works by inhibiting glutaminase, which deprives tumor cells of or in, deprives tumor cells of glutamate, which is a fuel source. So it's a metabolic pathway that it affects, totally different from the others that we've studied. Here's the trial design. It was a randomized trial, one-to-one, -one, teleglenostat plus cabozantinib versus placebo plus cabozantinib, primary endpoint, PFS, secondary endpoint, overall survival. So unfortunately, this was a negative trial. Um, no difference uh, here in terms of progression-free survival, the primary endpoint, and no difference in terms of overall survival. Um, here. So unfortunately, we won't move forward with this, but it's good that we tried. I think we still need to keep trying new agents. The next study is the PATMET trial. This is led by Monty Powell. This is a trial in papillary renal cell carcinoma, and here's the trial design. So patients with metastatic papillary renal cell carcinoma were randomized to one of four arms, all VEGF inhibitors, sunitinib, cabozantinib, crizotinib, and savolitinib, primary endpoint progression-free survival. So here you sort of see the consort diagram, 152 patients randomized. You can see how they sorted out in the arms. You'll notice the two arms on the left are more populated, if you look at the bottom boxes, than the two on the right. And that's because the crizotinib and savolitinib were closed early for futility, populating the two arms that were um, more active in early analysis, the sunitinib and cabozantinib. And here are the results. So in terms of efficacy, overall response rate, cabozantinib sort of rose to the top higher overall response rate in general and a higher stable disease as well compared to the other drugs. And when we look at progression-free survival on the left and overall survival on the right, we see an advantage to cabozantinib in terms of progression-free survival, probably equal overall survival. But I think the take home for most of us from this study um, is that cabozantinib is now really the frontline standard of care in papillary renal cell carcinoma. And of course, more work to be done in papillary to improve the overall survival outcomes. So now I'd like to talk to a drug that I'm personally really excited about, and we've had the opportunity at Fox Chase to work with, along with the collaborators here, and that's a drug, Belzutifan. Um, and here's how it works. So Belzutifan um, works on the VHL pathway. So as we know, VHL is effective in most renal cell carcinomas. When it's working normally, it takes HIF2 alpha and targets it for proteasomal degradation in normoxic conditions. When it's not working, HIF2 alpha translocates to the nucleus dimerizes with HIF-1 beta and forms a transcription factor that then leads to transcription of all these things that make tumors grow, um, markers for proliferation, survival, metastasis, and angiogenesis. Now, some of these we inhibit downstream with agents we currently have um, in the clinic, 
but belzutifan comes in and inhibits that dimerization. So it sort of inhibits HIF2 activity at its source. So this drug was developed by, by Peloton and then bought by Merck. And this is the initial clinical trial that had a dose escalation cohort, which I won't speak much to, included multiple tumor types and a 55 patient clear cell renal cell carcinoma cohort. And you'll see here that many of them had had pr multiple prior therapies. 62% had greater than three multiple prior therapies before entering this trial. Um, most were intermediate or poor risk. And so here are the data. And um, on the left, you'll see the, the waterfall plot where you see most patients have tumor shrinkage. There's a large percent of patients with partial response. Again, this is in the multiple pretreated setting. Um, and on the right is the swimmer's plot. And I just wanna take a moment to make a personal connection with permission to this swimmer's plot. Um, so I think Ralph Knapp or Brenda are out there somewhere. I see Brenda. I don't know if Ralph is here, um, but Ralph was a patient I share with Dr. Hammers. Um, I told him I'd be presenting these data today and he's swimming. He's still swimming in the swimmer's plot um, as part of his, his sort of excellent response to this drug in addition to prior and subsequent therapies. So um, I just wanna say, you know, whenever we look at these, each of these waterfall plots is a patient, each of these swim lanes is a patient and we're fortunate at Fox Chase to have met some of them as I know some of you have. Um, so in terms of progression-free survival, again, in the clear cell cohort, um, here we have the early progression-free survival data. Again, this is in a multiple pretreated cohort. And this drug is now in phase three trials and also in a phase two dose finding trial, um, which is right now how we have access to it for our clear cell patients. Okay, so let's switch to a smaller cohort of patients. This was a clinical trial. Dr. Yonash was um, instrumental in this with the group at the NCI looking at belzutifan and VHL disease. So these are patients who have VHL syndrome, so to speak. Their VHL is defective uh, because of heritable germline alteration. Uh, they had to have greater than or equal to one measurable tumor, and they were managed to enroll 61 patients to this study where they were all dosed with belzutifan in a single arm fashion. So here are the patient characteristics of the 61 patients. You can see a lot of them had pancreatic lesions, uh, hemangioblastomas and retinal lesions as well, which come with the syndrome. And so here's a pretty dramatic waterfall plot showing really good responses to the, uh, patients in this cohort. Granted, this is a rare disease, um, but almost really every single patient showed tumor shrinkage after being treated with belzutifan. And this drug is now FDA approved for this small group of patients with VHL disease based on this. Um, the overall response rate, 50%, but you can see shrinkage in everyone. And so here, I think um, if there were sort of an Oscar for the best figure of 2021, I'm gonna give it to this figure. <laughs> okay, so this is sort of a brilliant way of showing how this drug has affected patients with BHL disease. So here we have patients, you'll see the black bar is when they started on the study. And these are patients who are managed surgically, right? They have multiple tumors, multiple kidney tumors, multiple other tumors. Um, and each of the black dots to the left of that bar represent an intervention, a procedure to remove a tumor. And you can see it's peppered with black dots up until the line. And once they start on belzutifan, those three blue dots <laughs> represent the only three procedures among these 61 patients that had to occur, were determined clinically to occur after starting it. So I think this just shows in graphic form, um, the real sort of patient level impact of, of this agent, so. Okay, moving on, I have 40 more seconds. I'm gonna have to go over. All right, <laughs> um, I thought I had 10 minutes. So. Um, so here we have breaking news. This was an ASCO plenary adjuvant pembrolizumab after nephrectomy in renal cell carcinoma. Um, here's the study design. So this is a standard uh, adjuvant study design, a design that's familiar to us where patients at relatively high risk uh, for recurrence of kidney cancer after resection are randomized to pembrolizumab or placebo. And there is excellent commentary streamable online. You can see Dr. Shuri's ASCO presentation, Dr. McKay's uh, comments. I'll just briefly go over the data, which is that this was a study that was positive for disease-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.68. And overall survival, I was really glad it was presented. I'm also really glad to see those curves riding high, meaning most people are still alive, but that means we don't have enough events to show a difference in overall survival. Um, I'll direct you also to a podcast between Dr. Chueri uh, and Dr. Kudikoff, uh, where these results are sort of discussed in context of whether or not we should recommend them for patients um, based on disease-free survival data without overall survival data, but I won't comment on that today. 
Okay, here's another New England Journal article that came out in 2021. The CLEAR trial was presented, and rather than go through sort of the data, um, I'd like to go through this in the context of what we know already. Ooh, this did not render. This did not. This is like a really important <laughs> slide. I hope you have it memorized. I know. Okay, so I don't. Um, I think Brian tweeted this two days ago. So if you want to pull up your Twitter, you can see what this slide looks like. But basically, we have first line immunotherapy trials and metastatic renal cell carcinoma. They're all pretty much identically designed. The one on the left is Ipia Nevo, and then we have three TKI IO combinations that are listed here. And I'll just say, you know, we're comparing these together. Um, and there are small nuances in the design. I think I will state my opinion, which is that the clear data uh, show the lowest primary progression rate, the highest response rate, the best progression-free survival rate. And when we're looking to overall survival, those data, of course, will mature as the studies mature. But so far, I would say every single one of these is pretty much neck and neck um, in terms of how that goes. So I personally have changed my practice to more Len Pembro, um, but all of these are good. And I think we're lucky to have them. Um, a lot of them are, again, they're similarly designed, so they're asking the same question with the same comparator. And so I think we're allowed to put them on a slide like this. Um, but check your Twitter for Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually see the data there. Okay. And this was a meta-analysis buried in a poster at ESMO, um, but I thought it was interesting, where they looked at favorable risk renal cell carcinoma. And I think this is a group that you know, if there is some controversy in our field is what do we do with this group? They're going to do well. A lot of times we observe them. We've, we've demonstrated work on that, that it's okay to observe these tumors. But when it's time to treat with, what do we treat them with? And so this just showed, um, you know, compared to Sunitib, which is the black bar, that in general, in terms of overall survival, in this group, we're really not moving the needle compared to VEGF inhibitor therapy across these trials. And these are all the different um, combinations that you saw on the last slide. And then in terms of progression-free survival, um, probably Ipia Nevo is the one that is not <laughs> as effective in terms of progression-free survival in favorable risk, um, but the rest are sort of a little bit scattered. So I think we need to really look at long-term outcomes for this group that does well. So it'll take time for us to see um, overall survival benefits. So, so I, I think we're gonna take some questions. I think we're gonna do five or 10 minutes of questions after each talk. Let's see, I'll start great talk while people are thinking of questions. First of all, I totally agree with your last point, 100% agree with it. Um, going back to the Cantana study, do you think glutaminase inhibition, metabolic pathways in general, do you think it's viable in kidney cancer? Where is that going? Was that just one study and one drug? And Nazar's here who can comment. Maybe uh, yeah. you can comment first. And I'll Nizar, quickly comment. Comment. I'll say, you know, that's a, that's a clear negative study. And I think mm -hmm. we have to be honest about drugs that work, but also about drugs that don't work. I don't see that pathway as, as being compelling based on those data, but I'd love to see newer drugs doing the job better that might be able to capitalize on the pathway. Yeah. Nizar, do you want to say something? Yeah, thank you, uh, Brian, for bringing it up. I mean, we struggled, as you, you, you know, we struggled with why the study was negative. Was it because, uh, you know, cabozantin wasn't really the best partner with a metabolism drug like CBA39 or telaglenostat? or the patient population, which was unselected. Uh, and, and so this is the problem when you have a drug that's investigation and you really don't know which patients benefit and do we really have a signature or a biomarker that uh, we can select. So we had discussed that on the Euro Amigos, you know, you and I and Tom about this. So, and yesterday we heard about uh, a, a, you know, Abhishek, I don't know if he's still here, but Abhishek, yes. Uh, so we we asked that question, could uh, maybe CD18 antelagranstat combine uh, with with uh, the inhibitor that uh, you know he has could have made a difference. So it's really work to be done. I think we still need need new uh, agents and and new obviously discovered new targets. I don't think the metabolism story or the glutaminase is is dead. I don't think it should be. I think we should still come back to it and really uh, see exactly. And maybe we can go to the tissues. I think you're getting some tissues from uh, Calithera Biosciences to try to really see if we can then find those a subgroup of patients that could benefit from this strategy. Okay. Thanks. The, the other thing is really the interaction with the immune cell, not just the tumor cell with all this metabolism in RCC. And there's a very nice paper in Nature with Dr. Tim Ratmill and Jeff Ratmill that gives us a clue. I think this past is here to stay and we cannot say just because one drug failed that we shouldn't explore more. Okay. Question here. Uh -huh. Great talk, Dr. Fulman. For you know, everybody out on stage or even here, 
curious about the use of uh, belzutifan for VHL patients. So in practice, wh when should we start? And more importantly, when should we stop the, the, <laughs> the drug? Or is this something like mTOR inhibition, you know, TSC? So patient? I'm going to take that question since Dr. Yanesh is in the room by a microphone and is the senior <laughs> author on that study. Um, he's in the best position to answer. Yeah, great question. We don't have the answer to that in light of the fact that the trial was designed to actually, you know, we didn't have discontinuation in the design. However, logically, uh, we do have a few people who were off for a period of time and then restarted. We did see some growth during the off period, but it wasn't uh, an, an accelerated growth. So, you know, it stands to reason, and we've actually in the last month now put, I think, 25 people on the drug uh, and we're going to see what's happening. We're likely going to treat for a period of time. We're then going to, if we get the desired response, maybe take a break in some of these individuals to see whether or not uh, we, we can uh, in an ad hoc fashion. Also want to sort of give a shout out to some of my collaborators around the country here at Penn, Kate Nathanson, um, Kim Rathmel, Ophineliopoulos. We're building a post uh, register a post registration consortium where we can gather this data longitudinally, where we're going to be able to find out exactly how to treat these people. Can I follow up on a quick question on that? Do, the responses from different sites of the tumor are similar, or is there differences? Because that's very interesting. Um, there's numeric differences, but qualitative similarities. So you know, we see some degree of shrinkage in most lesions. Uh, be that a pancreatic cyst, pancreatic neuronicum tumors, hemangioblastomas, or renal cell carcinomas, or renal cysts. So, you know, it looks like anything that, you know, everything has a qualitative difference. But if you look in, you know, the, the, the abstract that we have at ASCO, uh, which is going to be similar to a, an upcoming publication, uh, you see that numerically, you know, it's 90% it's, uh, objective response rate in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, 49% uh, in renal cell carcinoma, 30% in hemangioblastomas. Thanks, sir. Abhishek. So uh, I'll make a very quick comment, and I think this is a great point and a great discussion uh, from both preclinical as well as the clinical side of things. The one thing I'll say is for all of the metabolic inhibitors, or in fact, anything else that we are studying, we are limited by eventual uh, preclinical studies in immunodeficient mice. And then using the metabolic inhibitors in people, ha we, we do not completely understand the impact that the metabolic inhibitors are having on the immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. And we know from Jeff Rathmel's work that that is a major concern. So glutaminase inhibitors could very well be having a favorable outcome on the, on, on, on the tumor itself, but at the same time, suppressing the clearance mechanisms also. And so uh, this is a big challenge for us. So I, I, I think that's one reason to keep an open mind about not just metabolic, but all other potential non-immune related mechanisms to target it. The only thing that we have to do is to do a better job of addressing the impact on these different cellular subtypes. And so, uh, I mean, we, we are doing work beyond just this pathway. Uh, there are many other, uh, both metabolic as well as non-metabolic pathways that we are currently targeting in the lab. And hopefully in the years to come, we'll be able to talk about that. Uh, but as a community, I think we should probably keep an open mind of uh, targets yeah, beyond probably. the immune space. Uh, and and yeah, as long yeah. as we can do a good job of like addressing Absolutely. that, then, then yeah. we stay there. Keep the, keep the science. Right. Thanks, Abhishek. So, so let me add to Abhishek's comments. I think the one concern right now in the fields in terms of biology, in terms of how that eliminates the research for clinical trials is that we still like one very robust immunocompetent model that can be used in a laboratory setting that we can test the immunotherapy efficacy or optimal combination. Then the fields will need to, to uh, better in terms of come up with this robust model, recapitulates the you know, kidney cancer such as CCRCC that we can be used to test those hypotheses. So that would be important. Okay, thank you. I think we're gonna move on in the interest of time. And coming to you live from London, my friend and colleague Tom Powell is gonna give us translational updates in kidney cancer. I think. Good <laughs> <laughs> afternoon, friend. Uh, Tom. Okay. 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 Tom, are you there? You just unmute, Tom. Someone text him. Well, somebody's working the slides. Was that us? 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Cool. I'm not very good at Zoom and stuff. I have had a year and a half of practice. I still can't do it, which is slightly embarrassing. I hope I'm better at biomarkers. I'm not sure I am. I was asked to do this talk last year and I did it so badly that I've asked to redo it as I was asked as a child many times to redo my homework. Um, on the last talk, I talked very much about why we were struggling a bit in renal cancer and a chap who won a Nobel Prize took exception to that. And, uh, and we had a debate which I subsequently lost. So it's not been a terrific session. I hope this is going to be better. Where I'm going to start is around this, this immune signature, this T effector signature, which is being talked about quite a lot. The original work came from Dave McDermott's uh, Nature Medicine publication. What Dave discovered with a collaborative group, particularly Sanj from um, Genentech, and I think sometimes the industry people uh, don't get as much credit for the hard biomarker work that's ongoing, particularly from that group. Um, but and Pretty was involved and Maruk and others. But what they showed was angiogenic signatures that could be measured by RNA and also immune signatures that could be measured. And actually we went on to validate this in the 151 trial. And also um, Tony uh, in Javelin also managed to validate this and other signatures. And I think this signature is real. Um, I talked about that last year. So I'm gonna talk about something different. Um, this is a piece of work published in Cancer Cell. Um, and um, essentially what this shows is we can subdivide patients into seven groups, but particularly there are these two red and purple angiogenic signatures. Look how many favorable risk patients have strong angiogenic signatures. That's why sunitinib works so well in that group and why ipinevo might be struggling a bit initially. But then there's some really powerful immune signatures um, and so certainly the green patients and the blue patients um, what do we do with this? Well, there does seem to be associated with outcome with sunitinib versus bevacizumab and atezolizumab. And this is a study which I think Brian's doing with this, this RINI criteria, which I've written down here, where one looks at this signature and then one can randomize to immune combinations versus um, immune VEGF combinations. And this is really important in my opinion while I think belzutifan and other drugs are super exciting, it's not like we have hundreds of new exciting drugs in kidney cancer. I think we need to do more biomarker work and work more on the drugs that we have at the moment. We haven't done that much great work, honestly, with CTLA-4, in my opinion. Um, CTLA-4, is a, I think it's an important drug. We know it works really well in some patients. Does it prolong survival in the end in everyone a bit? or are there specific patients? Um, this is a small piece of work, but I liked it. And the reason why I liked it is it's uh, uh, looking at CTLA-4, which is epigenetically regulated, and they correlated RNA expression with the epigenetic signatures. And then they showed that actually uh, it was associated with poor outcome, which could be rescued with, uh, with, with ipilimumab and the immune combinations. So it's slightly different but I think it's a really interesting piece of work and I wanted to congratulate the authors on that. But actually we do sort of know a little bit about CTA4 and actually in bladder cancer, it's the same. It does seem that PDL1, particularly tumor cell staining of PDL1 seems to be associated with good outcomes with immune therapy, but particularly CTA4 PDL1 combinations. You know, my preference, and I showed you um, the previous trial randomizing off the back of an RNA signature, I would actually be very comfortable rounding off the back of TC expression of PDL1. And we'd try, we're trying to do this work in Europe and Laurence Albigay has an important role to play in that. Um, I wanted to move with the same combination, Ipinevo, but this is a piece of work looking at um, the microbiome, CBM588. Um, CBBM, CBM588 um, is, um, uh, modulates um, by photobacterium, uh, which uh, is an important component of the microbiome, and, and actually dynamic changes 
to this was the primary endpoint of the trial. So this was a randomized trial with a biomarker primary endpoint. Could Ipinevo plus CBM588 alter the expression of bifidobacterium? And the answer to that question is it failed to hit its primary endpoint. Uh, now, I haven't got time to explain why that's the case, but I admire the authors for putting that as the primary endpoint. However, this um, modulation, this microbiome modulation, had a profound effect on PFS and OS. And I think this does open a new chapter, but clearly microbiome modification is an area in which we have to do a lot of biomarker research. And so this is, I hope, if I'm invited back next year, this I hope will be an area which will explode. I think there's activity here and it's really important. It's somewhat ironic or probably a paradox, it's not true irony, it's probably ironic that, uh, sorry, a paradox, that papillary renal cancer is actually moving faster with biomarkers than clear cell renal cancer. These data here are the savalitinib versus sunitinib work in met altered tumors. On the right hand side, we can see a 68% response rate for duvalumab and sunitinib in met altered tumors. And so one moves forward into a randomized phase three study, a Savoir trial, biomarker driven, papillary renal cancer, foundation one, met alterations, Savo Derva versus sunitinib. Super cool. And maybe actually ahead from biomarkers compared to clear cell renal cancer. Last year, I had a bit of a moan um, about why we don't have enough neoadjuvant trials in urothelial cancer, eh, sorry, in, in, in clear cell renal cancer. Here is the urothelial cancer data with, um, with seven trials. We don't have seven neoadjuvant kidney cancer trials. Kidney cancer trials should be easier. And we've got some great biomarker work off the back of these in lots of different cancers. Indeed, great work in lung cancer too. Ellie Van Allen produced this piece of work in cancer cell, about 10 patients, um, neoadjuvant before and after therapy. I think the really neat piece about this work is it's single cell RNA-seq. Bulk transcriptomics, I've done a lot of that work in my life. And you know what, particularly with treatment, you often get treatment related effects and not resistance related effects. So if you give chemotherapy and you do a post-treatment sample, you get lots of necrosis. And that actually from an RNA perspective, isn't that great. So I love this data. I think this single cell RNA-seq data is super cool. I haven't got time to go into huge detail, but essentially you can see two renal cell populations, TP1 and TP2. And you can see here um, immune checkpoint inhibitors having different effects on angiogenesis and phosphorylation signatures associated with these two populations. But actually my favorite bit about this work is about M1 and M2 macrophages and it's how immune checkpoint inhibitors clearly having an effect on adaptive immunity. I've spent a huge amount of time thinking about adaptive immunity recently, and I think it may be the adaptive immune component in clear cell, which is making clear cell renal cancer so different from other tumors in terms of response to immune therapy. Um, I wanted to go into some rare environments. I've got about a minute left or probably less than a minute. Um, we've done a little bit of work on brain metastasis. We have to do more work on brain metastasis, in, in my opinion, um, in this. We've taken a lot of brain samples from patients. We've got sequential brain samples. This work here suggests that there may be some subtle differences, particularly, for example, in FOXP3 uh, and active T cells in brain metastasis. We know, and Laurence Albigay produced a lovely piece of work earlier showing the Ipinevo not working terribly well. So is this why that's the case? Should we be looking at this group differently? We need biomarker work in this population. The final area which I wanted to talk about um, is, uh, is, of course, um, circulating tumor DNA. This is with some bladder cancer data looking at the predictive and prognostic effect of personalized ctDNA tracking, uh, whole exome sequencing, and then plasma isolating two or more DNA alterations in the plasma and predicting a response to a tezolizumab. This is exploratory work, but it's quite a long way ahead of what we're doing in kidney cancer at the moment. 
And I think we need to do some work in kidney cancer. Monty Powell's group has looked at this. This is not, this is a panel-based approach using the garden technology. And you can see here, the majority of patients, you can actually identify genomic alterations. Those genomic alterations in the right-hand side actually correlating not as frequently as we would like with tissue-based approaches. The question I put to you, is this because ctDNA is inaccurate using panel-based approaches, or actually is historical renal tissue really not that useful? And is that why we're getting held back for biomarker discovery in kidney cancer? I don't know the answer to that question. I put it to the group. Um, if we think about circulating biomarkers, we don't have to just do ctDNA. I showed last year a piece of work in Nature, uh, in nature Medicine around circulating IL-9 and IL-12 levels. Here we've got a smaller piece of work um, looking at circulating cytokines, ICI for immune checkpoint inhibitors with interferon gamma and IL-12 with dynamic changes, potentially significant VEGF targeted therapy with GMCSF and indeed VEGF levels. So there may be ways instead of that approach of using baseline tissue, we may be able to use circulating biomarkers to predict treatment. So give one month of therapy. If you don't get upregulation of one biomarker, add in a second drug or switch drugs. I actually think that approach of starting with one therapy, looking for dynamic changes and switching may be better than historically going back into tissue banks from five or six years ago and looking for your favorite gene. Again, controversial, I'm happy to discuss. I think for me, this is some of the most important biomarker data. We know sarcomatoid renal cancers now really do need to be treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's absolutely crucial, even in those healthcare environments that are really struggling. We know that sunitinib is not effective for these patients. We know that immune-based therapy is active and we know why that's the case. And the reason why is these patients have a much less strong angiogenic signature, a much stronger immune signature. And this biomarker work has told us that. So those people who say the biomarker work's not helping the clinical field, that's not right. It's begun, that, that process has begun. It will accelerate quickly. And I hope with some of the ideas I discussed today, I've got like 10 seconds for my summary. Um, I think um, the conclusions of this are shorter than I'd like it to be, but I think we are making progress compared to last year. We've actually got DNA and RNA signatures now in potentially prospective studies that we didn't have that last year. We've got this new field of circulating biomarkers. We didn't have that last year. We've got sequential tissue studies for the first time. We've got single cell RNA-seq. We didn't have that last year. We know more about why sarcomatoid tumors are responding to therapy, which I think is cool. There's lots to do. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey, Tom, how's London? Good. <laughs> I wish I was there with you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see any questions from the audience, Monty. Uh, uh, great, great summary, Tom. Uh, and I was just wondering, Brian, if, if uh, Tom had alluded to the study design that sort of capitalizes on some of the biomarker work you did. Excuse me, in Emotion 151. Could you expand on that a little bit? So we're, we're trying to get a study off the ground where we take frontline clear cell renal patients, determine their cluster in real time, which takes about two or three weeks. And then for cluster one and two who are angiogenic, give them an IOT, assign them an IOTKI, pick your favorite. Um, and then for four, five, and seven, which are more inflammatory, give them at B Nevo. And three and six, we think are sort of macrophage driven, we'll probably do something different with them. So for, for all the industry people in the room, we're desperately looking for funding. It's not the kind of study that, that industry is gonna fund. So we're, we're see, we just submitted a DOD grant on that. You know, so we'll see, but it's it's not randomized. It's just assigning people based on their biologic cluster, you know, compared to unselected control. So not perfect, but hypothesis generating. Tom, I, I have a question for you. So, you know, uh, winter is coming and that is the triple combination of uh, CTLA-4, PD-1 and VEGF, as well as with F2 inhibitor. How do you think the biomarker is gonna fare, especially if this is tolerated and it's gonna be standard? So listen, um, Tony, if the triplet comes in with an overall survival hazard ratio of 0 
a lot of what I've just said is going to become somewhat academic, and I accept that. Um, the likelihood of that happening, you know, I think the triplets will have a PFS advantage. I think they will have a response advantage. Clearly, Ipinevo is going to be outperformed by Cabonevo for response and PFS. So the real question is, those two endpoints, are they going to change the way we think? Well, not unless there's a major shift. But it is also relevant, I think, that we can, I think we can get to an environment where you don't need to have triplet therapy for all patients. I think there's clearly a subset of patients who do super well with Ipinevo. We don't know who they are. Um, we all know that VEGF targeted therapy for the rest of your life is unattractive for some patients. And if you don't need it, why have it? I think there is a need to do that test that Brian is suggesting, either with the immune signature or indeed with PDL1 expression, which uh, I think also has merit. Um, and then, of course, there are other triplets that are coming along as well. But the, the triplets with Belzutifan also, I would say, well, you know, that's going to be a VEGF signature, VEGF driven type approach. Is that going to be category one, category two? You know, the purple and the red patients, are they the ones that are really going to benefit from that? I think we do need to answer these questions, Tony. And, and, and I don't, you know, my nervousness, and I'm interested in what other people think. I don't think we have that many drugs in the locker in randomized phase three right now. So there is going to be a pause for breath after these triplet comes out. Yes, the, the adjuvant setting will change things a little bit, but ultimately we will have a pause where we can spend more time doing biomarker research. And we have done a lot of research in the last year to make the foundations for that possible. Okay, Dr. Atkins. Um, yeah, great talk, uh, Tom. Can you tell me what you think the best endpoint we should be tying our biomarker work to? Seems like a lot of the work is tied to response and PFS, but we're um, talking a lot about immune therapy trying to produce uh, overall survival benefits. So what should we be linking our biomarker work to for efficacy? There's only one person in the world who I fear a question more from than Mike Atkins, <laughs> and that's Rule Sadler, <laughs> who, who historically <laughs> single-handedly undermined all of my work very successfully. Uh, so Mike, thank you for that question. Um, and uh, and uh, it's terrific to, to see you. I'm sorry I'm not there with you. It's a real disappointment I'm not there. Uh, it's obviously a fantastic meeting and, um, and it's a real regret. Um, Mike, you know, this is what I think, and I'm not necessarily right. Um, but I think long-term durable remission is an important endpoint. I think for what it's worth, I think the Ipinevo 30% five-year durable remission rate is maybe the most important curve we have. Not the best curve. You know, I've said before, pick your combination and use it well. But that 30% long-term durable remission, that is, I think, what we should be going for. Ideally, you know, on or off therapy. So five years progression free. And we look at that population that haven't progressed on first line therapy and we try and find a biomarker for that group. I agree, CR, you know, short term CR, not that meaningful for me. Response rates, again, I feel the same way as you do about it. OS is always going to be a bit gray because there are going to be prognostic factors in there. And I think if we are going to get to that goal that Dave McDermott always talks about, which is triplet therapy for a finite period of time, stopping therapy and curing patients. Let's go after that 30 or 40% really aggressively, find out who they are and make kidney cancer more like testis cancer. I have a, a comment or a question maybe for Mike. I mean, I, I, I agree with Tom. I think some sort of landmark PFS is, is correct. I, I think you probably would agree with that. But how do we do that in these signal seeking trials? Right. We struggled with that with the trial that I described is, you know, response is just sort of the practical early one that we can get a signal. If we do PFS at two years, every trial we do is just going to take forever. And that we've, we've sort of struggled with that. I wonder if you had thoughts about. Yeah, well, I think we're trying to develop biomarkers, not just for, you know, a couple of years, but for the rest of time. And so I think we can afford to wait for those longer endpoints to see what the biomarkers are that predict for them, not just to try to um, do studies that focus on early endpoints that lead to approvals, but try to yeah. actually 
focus on things that really help patients in the long term and help achieve the endpoints that patients want. Brian, I agree with Mike. Um, I think that there is 426, and we haven't seen the biomarker data from that yet. I think we've got 214, and there's some data coming out, which, um, which Bob's leading, um, which, uh, which I like. Um, but, um, but I, you know, I, I, and obviously there's a clear trial. We haven't seen the biomarker data from that yet. These, the tissue exists for these studies because I think PDL1 was a stratification factor. So the tissue's there. Um, and Mike's right. We should be, this is, you know, drug development is often a short game because it's driven partly, uh, and I think the pharmaceutical industry does a terrific job in drug development, but it's partly driven by patent length and all the bits and pieces that we talk about. Biomarker work is a longer game, but we do have the time to do it and do it right and do it properly. And uh, now is a great opportunity because we can retrospectively go back and look at those long-term durable remissions. And we could compare those from 426 with those with 214 and look at their gene signatures and work out those patients that do exceptionally well with VEGF immune. And some of those patients will have early aggressive disease. And Tony, coming back to your question, why is the triplet important? And this is why I think the triplet trials are going to be positive, because although IPI, I think, is important in the long term, we know that there are patients who never get that long term opportunity because they need early VEGF control. And so what you'll get with the triplet is you get early control with VEGF PD-1, 70 percent response rate. And then some of those patients who wouldn't have responded with IPI Nevo will then get the opportunity to get long term benefit um, from IPI. And those patients, we need to know what their signature is because they need the triplet. There'll be other patients who don't need that triplet. Yeah, so maybe, do maybe, Tom, maybe, maybe. I, I think one strategy here is not to get ahead of ourselves. All these biomarkers need to be reproduced. We could not reproduce as well in Javelin Renal 101, which has way more patient and better specimen quality than McDermott et al., you know, except in the angiogenic signature. So. Part of me, I don't want to get ahead. Biomarker is my passion and what I do when I'm not in clinic. But also, we conducted a study with Dr. McKay, omnivore, starting by Nevo, and adding IPI later. And we had an attrition rate of 50%, 5-0. So one strategy, at least, if you say, you know, is starting with all this drug and then de-escalating. Yeah, you don't need the VEGF target. Maybe you don't need the PD-1 inhibitor, but perhaps one strategy is starting with everything, taking in consideration the significant tox and the toxicity. So maybe focus on a group of intermediate and poor risk. And having said so, we are uh, actually 10 minutes away. So I wanna introduce Dr. Bob Modzer here. Uh, Dr. Mozart does not actually need an introduction. He's been involved with almost every drug for the past 30 years developing uh, the drug. So Bob is going to tackle the trial in progress that are ongoing or planned in kidney cancer. Bob? Okay, thanks very much. So first, I, I just wanted to applaud the kidney can and the organizers of the committee for, for, this, for this meeting. I think it's, it, it's really a wonderful uh, experience. Um, I can remember years back whenever we would have a meeting or a conference for kidney cancer, we were, we were lucky if five people signed up. And I'm sure Michael remembers that too. It was usually the same 10 people in the room and that was it. And so I think the dramatic gains we've made and the interest from the patient advocacy groups and others has really, really fostered this kind of experience. So I think, um, you know, I was given the task of, um, of, of what are the important <laughs> trials on the progress uh, in the progress and their significance. And I think it's important for, um, for two reasons for this sort of a meeting. Um, one, I mean, I think obviously the ultimate goal for all our work is patient benefit and patient benefit is demonstrated in these late stage designs. The other thing is, is um, the goal is to have science um, direct our clinical trials uh, to drive our clinical trials. But frequently, and I've seen it in our field in particular, the, the, the opposite is important as well. And that is the gains that we make in the clinical trials are turned around and they, uh, and they foster an interest in underlying the science. So um, I went through and um, I did a survey basically of the, uh, of the big phase three trials and some of the other studies 
that I think we should all be aware of. And I'm yeah. also <laughs> not able to move that. These are my disclosures. Next. So um, in, in ncitrials.gov, um, these are the, uh, the first line phase three trials that I think you should be aware of. Um, and we'll, some of these are completed accrual. I'm, I'm not gonna show the schema for those that are completed accrual, but I will show those that are still uh, open to accrual for patient benefit and to direct your patients to. And so the COSMIC 313 is, uh, we mentioned that, that looks at the triplet of CABO NEVO IPI versus NEVO plus IPI. I think that's a key trial. Hopefully we'll get information of that uh, next year. Whoops, back, you're a little too quick for me here. Um, the other trial that, uh, that I think is very important is the one that uh, Michael Atkins is leading, which is a randomized phase three trial looking at NEVO monotherapy versus, uh, versus the uh, doublet NEVO plus IPI. And also uh, the study that Nazar has mentioned here in terms of the nectar compound which combines nectar plus Nevo versus either Cabo or Sanetinib, and that's completed accrual as well in the first line setting. There are two here that are actively accruing. We'll show the schema for that in a minute. And if you wanna to switch to the next slide. The other, uh, I think important question is the role for uh, surgery and first line therapy given the Carmina data. And I'll show you the schema for the probe trial as well. Next. So this is a, a large phase three trial that's building on um, some of the premise that Betsy mentioned in terms of the, uh, of the extraordinary data we've seen in the CLEAR trial with Pembro plus Lumvatinib. Uh, and this is looking at uh, two triplets compared to a doublet in first line therapy. Uh, a significance of this is that it is, it is incorporating Belzutifan into the first line therapy in a uh, combination. So this is a trial that's sponsored by Merck. Uh, I believe Brian to my right is the PI of this trial and it's accruing well and I would encourage you to direct patients there and our, and our own patients to this uh, very important trial. Next slide. Work for the cooperative groups is according is essential. It's been a long-standing tradition in an RCC, and so this is a, a trial, a phase three trial that is open, to the best of my knowledge, and uh, that is accruing patients through the alliance. Uh, and this this uh, also builds upon the Cosmic uh, three one three trial in that it uh, is looking at really kind of the role of uh, a triplet or, or um, with NEVO plus IPI versus NEVO uh, or the addition of CABO for, um, for first line therapy for uh, RCC. Uh, so I think this is a very important uh, trial that's being done through the cooperative group that's open and it's enrolling patients. The other to mention is the uh, SWOG probe trial, which um, which uh, builds upon the, uh, the question of the, the uh, role of the cytoreductive nephrectomy in first-line therapy. And so this is a study that looks at ipinevo first-line compared to either a delayed cytoreductive nephrectomy versus, uh, versus not. And so I think that this is also a, a critical trial uh, for moving our field forward. Next slide. So the next uh, space is uh, that there's been high interest in is in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant phase three trials. And so I've, I've highlighted those uh, here that are either uh, ongoing and that they've completed accrual but haven't been analyzed yet or um, uh, are actively accruing patients for now. And so, the PROSPER trial, again, another, neo, uh, another cooperative group trial that looks at uh, neoadjuvant um, NEVO followed by nephrectomy, followed by adjuvant uh, NEVO compared to nephrectomy alone. Um, it's the only prospective phase three trial that I'm aware of that looks at ne uh, an IO in the neoadjuvant space. I think that's a critical trial uh, after a long time coming, that's completed accrual now with 766 patients. Uh, building on the work that uh, Betsy mentioned in terms of uh, the PEMBRO trial that uh, 
Um, Tony recently and, and others published the New England Journal of Medicine. There's three other large randomized trials that are looking at the role of IO in the adjuvant space. And so uh, one of them is the Emotion 010, which is a straightforward trial of a TESO versus placebo in high-risk RCC. And, and that's completed accrual as well. Uh, hopefully we'll have some signal to that next year. The, uh, the only one that's ongoing in the US is the Checkmate 914 study. Uh, so I'll show you the, um, the schema for that in a minute. Um, most of the large randomized phase three trials through ncitrials.gov are all being done in the US or at the global US and Europe. The only one I could find that is only that is being done outside the US is the Rampart trial. And that's the uh, one that's sponsored by AstraZeneca. I know, I don't know too much on that, about that trial. I know Tom is on the call and maybe he can uh, speak to that uh, in terms of the this, this status of that trial. Next slide. So this is the Checkmate 914. It's the only one of the ongoing studies in the US that I'm aware of for adjuvant trial. Interesting study in that it started out as a comparison of Nevo plus Hippie versus placebo and accrued 800 patients and then morphed into a, uh, a basically a second study that included Nevo monotherapy to address the issue of whether uh, Nevo monotherapy is adequate and how it compares in, in terms of the component of care with Nevo plus Hippie. So this study, I think, is about 1,400 patients and has accrued about 1,200 patients. We're hoping that this study will complete some accrual sometime in the next uh, couple months. Um, moving on, the next space for phase three trials, which is a very important one, is for the previously treated patients. So the, the gains that we've made in first line with uh, IO uh, combinations has really um, left us with an unmet need to determine what's the best course for therapy for patients who have progressed on IO, IO, or IOTKI. And since there's been such a, a rapid and complete change in paradigm for first-line therapy. So these are the studies that are large phase three trials that are addressing that question. I don't know too much about uh, the very first one, um, but we will show you the schemas of the other since they're all accruing patients. And this is really a, an area of high unmet need for us to define best therapy for our patients. Next slide. So this is MK6482005 that is obviously a, a pivotal trial for uh, us moving forward in the RCC space. Since in my opinion, MK6482 or Belzutifan is probably the most promising, significant of the new drugs that we've seen since, uh, since the IOs were, uh, just, uh, were, were studied. And so this is a randomized phase three trial in, in previously pre-treated patients comparing uh, this compound to Everolimus. Uh, and this study uh, is uh, continuous. I had hoped it had uh, completed accrual, but it, my understanding is it's, it's continued to uh, uh, enroll patients uh, in the US and outside. Contact 03 is another key trial because one of our questions has been really you know, what's the role for continued IO therapy and second or third line therapy in terms of patients who have progressed on a first line IO agent? And so this is the CONTACT-03 trial. I think, I think Monty Powell and uh, Tony are the PIs on this study. And um, uh, the other particularly important part of this trial is that the histology is not only directed to clear cell, but includes the non-clear cell uh, cell types as well, which again is an area that really uh, uh, needs more thorough evaluation. So I think this trial is wrapping up accrual and hopefully we'll get an answer to this fairly soon. Next, the MK6482011 uh, study is looking at uh, belzutifan plus lenvatinib versus cabozantinib. Uh, it builds upon the work that David McDermott uh, presented at ESMO, looking at the, ca uh, the combination of CAVO plus Belzutifan versus CAVO. And so this is a, a trial that um, 
started rolling a couple months ago and uh, has, uh, is currently accruing in the US and, and elsewhere as well. Next slide. Um, the Avio uh, folks have been with us for a long time, uh, struggling uh, to find a, a place for Tavoznov in our um, in our armamentarium against RCC. Um, Tavoznov was recently uh, approved in heavily pretreated patients in a trial, uh, the TiVo the uh, three trial that uh, compared Tavoznov to cabozantinib. And so this is a study. This is Avio's study that is, again, looking at the question really in terms of what's the role for continued IO therapy in combination with a TKI um, compared to TKI alone in people who have progressed on IO therapy. So that this trial just recently opened accrual and I, uh, I suspect will complete accrual pretty rapidly in the US and, and elsewhere. Next. So uh, in the last few minutes I have, I'm just going to those are, those are the big phase three trials. And for the most part, our standard of care is, is changed by the phase three trials. There's some other different trials and strategies I just wanted to highlight, although there's so many when you, uh, when you uh, look on nci.trial.gov and through the centers. So let's just go to non-clear cell first. So the problem we've had with non-clear cell studies is the tumors are, are, are rare and they're heterogeneous. And so it's been very, uh, very difficult to, to study non-clear cell RCCs. Um, I have to applaud Monty Powell for his efforts that was also highlighted by, uh, by uh, uh, Elizabeth regarding the, uh, the study of the, M uh, of the uh, Zinitinib versus uh, Cabozantinib and the other uh, 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 agents that was recently published in Lancet Oncology, a, a randomized trial. For the most part, there's not too much uh, that I could find on ncitrial.gov about this particularly important space. This is the one trial that's going on uh, globally uh, that is looking at Limvat. The Pembro is a single uh, agent, uh, a single arm study for non-clear cell. And this trial is uh, well on its way to completing uh, enrollment around the world. I think this will be a very important study. Next. Um, a couple other drugs I think we should mention uh, here and studies we should mention that aren't in phase three, but they're, they're in large phase two studies. And this is one of them, MEDI5752, which is a, it's a, really a bispecific Product that targets both PDL1 and or PD1 and uh, and anti CTLA4, and so this is a large randomized phase two trial that's looking at that particular combination uh, in in uh, in combination with IO therapy. Study going on different places. I'm not so much aware about it. I know Martin Voss from our center has been very much involved in. Uh, and, and oversight of this trial may want to comment on, on this as well. But I think this is an interesting compound that's, uh, that's well underway in development. Next slide. Um, in terms of designs for trials, uh, they become very complicated, answering many different questions. And so uh, this is again, a, a large randomized phase two trial uh, that is being done both in first line and second line, looking at all different combinations with regard to, and, and some of us are involved in this, I believe. Uh, I believe that this, this slide's taken from Betsy from a trials in progress that she did at a recent meeting uh, with oversight of this particular trial, combinations of levatinib, Pembro, Belzutifan, and other uh, combinations. So a very complicated study, but uh, it kind of reflects really kind of a new design in terms of way how multiple combinations are being looked at rapidly to uh, expedite our field moving forward. Next slide. So um, I put up this as the last slide, um, and uh, this is a, a multi-center trial that's being done to look at uh, CAR T cells. And, um, I mostly put this up because uh, you know this is largely a meeting that's attended by scientists, 
And so from on the clinical end, I mean, we, uh, we hear different things, but we all, always know exactly from the science end, uh, you know, what, what's felt to be the most important or promising moving forward. And so from the clinical end, we hear a lot about CAR T cells, and I would be really interested in hearing from this group kind of what they feel is the promise of CAR T cells. Is this gonna be the next sunitinib? Is this gonna be the next ipinevo? Or is, is it gonna be more of a, you know, a dream? And so I, uh, there are a number of novel treatment strategies that are put up, but from the clinical end, this is the one we're hearing about every day. And so I'd be interested in your input in this. Last slide. So I just <clears throat> threw up a couple of questions, noticing now that I misspelled discussion here. <laughs> But, um, uh, and so I think, you know, in terms of there is a, a lot of high level clin clinical investigators in the audience, just as there are scientists. So, I mean, I think these are some points to discussion. You know, what phase three trials do you really feel are gonna move the, the field forward? Uh, I think another question at the clinical end that we're asking is, well, we've seen this great data with the PEMBRO adjuvant trial. I mean, is it enough? to really make a complete change in paradigm and treat uh, you know, uh, thousands of patients each year in the US or hundreds of thousands internationally with adjuvant therapy based on that data. Do we need more? Uh, what's gonna be the impact of the, uh, of the adjuvant trials that I just showed you? If they're, if they're negative, our experience with TKI is we had one positive trial and four that were negative. So if those are negative, is adjuvant therapy gonna be out the window? Do we need to see positive outcomes from that trial to move that forward for the change in paradigm? Another question that uh, I know um, I've heard Tom speak to on many different occasions is now with the bar of OS with these different trials, I mean, do we need an OS bar now? Is that something where if we don't see a benefit in OS in the phase three trial, not enough? Um, how do we advance the field for non-clear cell RCC histologies? There's been many Patient advocates have been very much involved with this because it's been an area that we really haven't been to, uh, to investigate thoroughly and, and, and patients and physicians have been very frustrated with the lack of therapeutics for non-clear cell RCC. And then the last really for the scientists is from your end, what, how do you rate promise of some of the newer strategies in terms of actually moving the field forward and in particular the CAR T cell strategy? So those are just some questions I put up, although I, I guess I'm, I'm over, uh, over time here. I don't know if we'll have time for discussion, but that's something that I put up. Thank you, Bob. We, we are on time, but I'm gonna make an executive decision and make the 30 minute long break a bit less, maybe 25 minutes or 20, and take a couple of questions from the audience, because I feel all of us here uh, we, we spoke and uh, there is virtual. We don't want to ignore our virtual, the majority. Um, maybe this one, um, maybe for Tom. Tom, are you still around? Yes, I am, Tony. I'm looking forward to your question. Okay, yeah, I can't yeah, hear you're you. On mute, Tom. You're on mute. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I, I, you can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we very well. <laughs> great, great. So, uh, Tom, question came from the virtual. Uh, uh, audience about the roles, and you've been involved in that in, in bladder cancer, about the application and data for use for circulating uh, tumor cells in RCC, not CFDNA, but tumor cells. What's your uh, take on this? Yeah, so uh, I think there are two ways of measuring circulating tumor cells. One is a personalized approach where one mashes up the whole exome sequencing of the tumor, identifies uh, DNA alterations, uh, identifies them in the plasma and then tracks them with time. And then there's a second approach, which is a, that's quite time consuming, quite expensive, um, but it's, I think it's quite cool. And then there's a second approach, which is a, a less subtle approach, which is a panel-based approach where one just looks for key cancer mutations. They, the second approach tends to be focused more on lung cancer because you have, to, you have to pick the panels and stick with them. You can't mix and match too much. And so they tend to be based around colorectal cancer, breast cancer, uh, commoner cancers, where the panel, well, lung cancer, uh, where, um, where there's personalized therapy. And therefore, people don't tend to do it for kidney cancer. And as you know, kidney cancer is a slightly quieter tumor. 
There was some work done by Monty Powell's group, um, which uh, used the garden technology, which is a panel based approach uh, and found 83% of patients uh, had uh, alterations. How much of this was noise associated with white cells? You know, it's a difficult question. VHL when about 23% of patients was identified. I think, and I really do think this is going to happen. I think that the process of tracking patients using blood-based approaches, whether it's CT DNA or methylation signatures, and Tony, I think you had some nice work in Nature Medicine from your group on the previous year, looking at methylation signatures uh, in renal cancer, which I think look pretty cool. But I think methylation signatures, CT DNA potentially, um, but also other approaches with chemokine and cytokine expression, which look cool in kidney cancer, I think those approaches may in the end superseding radiology to predict relapse. In urothelial cancer, we're already talking about that. We're doing a study called Invigo 011, where uh, instead of doing, we are doing radiology too, but we're tracking CT DNA after a cystectomy. And if you become positive, irrespective of your radiology, you, you're randomized as an advanced patient. So I think the key to that, Tony, is this field for me is moving faster than drug development uh, at the moment. The kidney cancer field is perhaps not as advanced as the lung cancer or the uh, indeed even the bladder cancer field in this, but I think we will catch up soon. I think it's an incredibly exciting area. And, and we saw a beautiful presentation from Dr. Scott Hack at uh, Vanderbilt, how he's trying to look at different ways here. Monty, maybe a question for you. I know you're not, but the question came through the virtual about the next step in microbiome uh, research and treatment selection after your stunning, excellent randomized trial. Yeah, and and, uh, and uh, Nasli Guzman is going to sort of recap some of our, our data in that phase one experience. But, uh, you, you know, for, uh, to those in the audience today, we're certainly looking for partners to take this data to the next stage and explore the same agent in the larger randomized study. Perfect, perfect. So I think we are done. We have 15 to 20 minutes for a break, short break. Thank you, everyone.